Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Max Min. Uh, now, to, now Matt Bright will talk about chiral distances of two dimensional lattices. Uh, over to you, Matt. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, where I, I now have the graveyard shift, but fortunately, there's quite a few I can, uh, because of our previous discussions, a few, a few slides I can skip a little. So, Matt, excuse me, I would like to open oh. your video. We'll start video. Ah. There we go. Hopefully, I'm. And no, I think you need to. Uh, I'm using the order of this to happen. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, to expand elsewhere. Also, in a sense, they're kind of, you know, fundamental units of periodicity. Um, and as we're going to see now, hopefully, uh, we can, in fact, just do real too loud. There we you think too, too many. Um, we can do different chemical things with them. Uh, we can actually kind of investigate real chemistry. Uh, so I'm going to, those of you who might have been here last year, obviously, we, we kind of begun to develop the invariants and talk a little about those. So I'm going to rattle through that fairly quickly. <clears throat> then I'm going to talk about the extension to this idea of chiral distances. So, in the extension, these kind of continuous measures of, of, um, of symmetry or asymmetry. Mm -hmm. um, in practice, uh, I'm going to look at how we've kind of explored <clears throat> the 2D lattice geometry surrounding 3D crystals. Slightly artificial case that gives you a kind of a view of the geometry of the universe of, of structures when you see the first continuous views. Uh, and I'm going to start kind of applying that. Obviously, the most obvious application is in the burgeoning world of, of two dimensional uh, monolayer materials and their lattice geometry. Um, I'm not going to dwell a lot on proofs and a lot of details because that's, that's a kind of a hard thing to follow in the talk. Uh, so these are the references, and they're also in the abstract that you can find if you want to go into a, into the sort of very deep mathematical exposition of these results and how and why uh, they do what they say they do. Um, so yes, this is just a schematic uh, summary of the, of the problem that, uh, that that we're all trying to solve, um, and I think the colleagues been through that enough to explain what the, what all of these words mean, which essentially is is is, is what we have here with this invertibility. But it, we're doing this in the context of of lattices, two-dimensional lattices, and just illustrating that the sort of <clears throat> the continuity requirement of the top-level problem uh, gives you a secret requirement to find a metric on whatever space you're mapping to that actually actually works like a metric. So, so, um, and we're trying to sort of solve that problem for lattices, and lattices are very simply defined as integer combinations of linearly independent bases um, in Rn. In this case, we're we're, we're doing not two, although some of the principles as we're you know, discovery will not discuss today, but a lot of the principles here do actually apply uh, in R3. They start being a bit more wobbly in R4, R5, R6, but then we're just a lot of a uh, the, the, the interest there is, is, is more limited. So obviously, um, you know, there's always a discrete classification, and the discrete classification in two-dimensional lattices is nice and uh, simple and very well known. We have five uh, distinct simply point groups, uh, <clears throat> four of which um, Include a reflection, so essentially, our, our, you've got a reflection which is which is an isometry, and and one of which the sort of P two group is not. And we've got these in the sort of various notations. There is sort of Schoenflings and urban Morgan notation for these things. Uh, but what we mainly talk about, because we're mathematicians here, is we kind of talk about them in terms of um, we we call these groups D two or D four. These are dihedral groups. Uh, symmetrically, as it were, so the group of the symmetry group of a, of a square, of a hexagon, uh, and of a rectangle, although there are obviously two kinds of those that are, are centered or, or non centered. Quick bit of terminology, uh, because it is slightly confusing in general, and this is kind of the official definition um, lattices with, which are only sort of centro symmetric, lattices which are, are purely only have this kind of centro symmetry by inversion, and again, just just to be clear, these things are stuck in the plane. Don't think of them as being embedded uh, in 3D, so I can flip them over. I can't. That's in, that, that's kind of important. So, the, so these uh, these things are, by inversion are uh, we call them oblique. Everything else is non-oblique, including uh, you know, centered rectangles and including hexagons. Uh, so this isn't to do with oblique and acute angles in the uh, in the technical sense, uh, in, in the kind of school sense. Uh, oblique just means 
anything that has any higher symmetry, as it were, than the, um, uh, than, than say C two than the, the central symmetric inversion, the central symmetric symmetry. Um, and you know, we we talk about the problem in in two D that that you can take for any lattice, you can take sort of any basis you like, as long as it's linearly independent. Uh, or sort of related by um, integer matrices uh, with, with determinant one. But of course, any crystallography would tell you well, that's not a problem because uh, we know reductions and we know several reductions. We can always pick something unique. Um, and in two dimensions, the kind of equivalent, in essence, of, uh, of the Nigli reduction. Indeed, what Nigli sort of early papers, which I've, I've sort of had a look at in, in a slightly clunky translation, you know, sort of defines this first before he goes into the three dimensional Nigli reduction. Uh, this is this is um, uh, this is a uniquely specified reduced basis, uh, and most redu reductions are a set of inequalities, um, and then sort of special conditions of what to do if those inequalities become equalities. Uh, and the special conditions are actually the sort of slightly less mathematically tractable notions. Uh, but you know that this this kind of is is perfectly fine. This absolutely unambiguously this list of. Uh, so that you know an ordered set of lengths and the fact that the inner product, this is the, the standard dot product that we all know from school, um, has to be negative and in between minus a half and, and zero. And if we have equality of uh of two lattices, then we we pick uh the obtuse angle rather than the acute angle if we go back up here. You know, there's there's one or or other you can pick. And yes, this perfectly unambiguously defines a two-dimensional lattice. But the problem is that uh, the, the, all of these definitions provably break continuity. And this is kind of the schematic from one of our papers uh, about that. You can imagine this, um, you know, taking a, a nice square lattice here, and then, then kind of taking a continuous family of lattices where you distort them. If I pick this reduction, so I'm picking here, say, a, a obtuse, um, uh, an obtuse angle uh, as close to uh, 90 as I can, which is essentially what this what this means. Uh, then you, um, at some point, when you kind of go over a certain threshold, when you head towards a particular higher symmetry, kind of centric symmetric, the the reduction will sort of pop you to a completely discontinuous basis. So the parameters out of so if I if I make my invariant say my isometry invariant that I'm heading for out of just the parameters of a, of a reduced basis, uh, then it's not going to be continuous uh, because I'm gonna I'm gonna hit some some threshold uh, which it will it will very suddenly decide to make a different decision oh, and i'll illustrate that later the solution as it turns out uh is one that was discussed initially by his selling um and, and alone way back and then elucidated a bit further by conway and sloan which was kind of foundational paper to a lot of this uh this work which is to use something called the obtuse super base so a super base is uh, a very simple thing it, it adds an extra vector to your lattice basis which is just the negative sum uh, of, of, of your chosen um, uh, of your chosen basis, and then you you demand that the uh, angles between all of those uh, are uh, or the inner products are are non positive. Um, so uh, so and that becomes an obtuse superbase, and it turns out without going into a lot of details that this is indeed unique um, up to isometry, but unfortunately not quite up to. To, to rigid motion. So if you're stuck in the plane for, for rectangular lattices, there are several uh, possible kind of uh, uh, choices of a few superbase for a, for, a, for a primitive rectangular lattice. But in general, you know, up to this this consideration, which we shall deal with, they, these are uh, this this is a unique choice, genuinely unique, and it's also, as it turns out, continuous. And this schematically illustrates why it's continuous. Again, why is a reduced basis discontinuous? Well, let's imagine that we're we're using this reduction and we're just using these these obtuse angles and again you can see if i this is just a any old invariant i've imagined it as a number here and as i kind of say um slowly deform a lattice this invariant might change continuously but as soon as it hits this uh if i've kind of insisted on it for example being obtuse and as soon as it hits this symmetric threshold uh then it then it's suddenly going to pick a different Lattice basis, and uh, and if I've computed this from from these vectors, then that's suddenly going to be uh, going to change discontinuously. Um, the best way to imagine an, why an, an, an obtuse superbase works in this sense, and you'll you'll, you'll see it more more concretely in a bit, um, is that um, as I continue this deformation, um, yes, you do kind of get a sudden uh, a sudden change in in 
any given pair of the vectors, but that sudden change kind of snaps your third vector so that one of them is changing continuously. So if you see this third vector, I get you the, the kind of the metaphor I always have in my head is you've kind of wrapped a rubber band around these three vectors, and as you kind of slowly deform them, it kind of snaps into different shapes, uh, but you've got you you kind of got a, a continuous set of parameters uh, to work with. So 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 continuity kind of holds for any given pair. And so if you derive from that uh, this thing called the root invariant, uh, which is just the um, uh, there's a lot of words on this. I won't go go through them all. Uh, which is just all the other products, uh, and and you order them. Then, uh, then, then that is uh, an isometry invariant of uh, of an obtuse superface. Well, if you, you get it from the obtuse superface, and it, it's an isometry invariant of the lattice, not a rigid motion invariant, uh, because we have an issue around sign. So we have to kind of decide how to order uh, the vectors of, of the obtuse superface, and then we have to think about sort of what that order means geometrically. And the way to encode that. Uh, is by ordering your vectors such that uh, you've got ordering your vectors by length, picking the two shortest vectors, turning them into a two by two column matrix uh, using the vectors as columns, and then the sign is the determinant, and that actually uh, distinguishes between two mirror uh, mirror reflections of the same of the same lattice. Um, incidentally, the the reason that we we pick this ordering sort of uh, is if you then take this particular triple. If we order the vectors so that we and then we label them so that we say v1 and v2 and v0, uh, so v0 in theory or negative sum of the other two, uh, then if you define the root products as it were, so these are the square roots of the um, the square roots of the end products. We take the square roots of the end products because that gives you the units in which all the distances are being measured. So strong in this case, um, and you kind of define these. So your these Indices obviously intuitively give you the, the kind of inner product between V1 and V2, V0 and V1, and so forth. And the ordering of the lengths automatically orders the, the root invariant. And then you can just add a sign to it if you want to know um, which way around it is, and you add the sign as it's as it's defined there. And what that means is that you have in fact got a space of all lattices. You've got a space of all two-dimensional lattices, but it's a three-dimensional space. It's a it's a triangular cone, it's just all of the all of the points in R3, um, such that the bx coordinate is less than the y coordinate, which is less than the z coordinate, um, and that defines a that defines a cone in the space. Now, if I want to, uh, so any point in that space is an isometry invariant of a lattice. If I care about rigid motion invariants, if I care about reflections, um, I can do some gluing. I can do some topological gluing, so I can glue a second cone. Um, uh, now. In essence, the choice of where I where I put that uh, that second cone is arbitrary, uh, but I'm you know gluing it here makes a, a sort of some intuitive geometric sense. So that's there. so so that's what we do in this case. Uh, but you can see that there's a kind of nice relationship between the discrete classification and this continuous classification, uh, in the sense that all of these higher symmetry lattices live in low dimensional subspaces of R three. So. Um, as it turns out, quite interestingly, the uh, the centered rectangular lattices live, live in a couple of disconnected two-dimensional subspaces. Um, this is sort of labeled in brown here. Uh, the primitive rectangles kind of live on the floor of this cone, as it were. And then, you know, the as sort of it, the intersection of these two disjoint spaces of centered rectangular lattices gives you where the hexagonal lattices live. And the uh, you know the the intersection of uh, your centered rectangular lattices and your primitive rectangular lattices is obviously a square lattice because you can imagine doubling the square. And it's it's also a centered rectangular lattice. Let's ask a question. Yeah. Um, so you're why are you doing this? Like you've got you've got a lattice. Yeah. And. If you take one definition of the lattice, I think I'll step in and say it's like a set of points. Yes. And it's periodic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. And then what we can do is we can say, oh, another way of getting that is that we define a basis. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, the tip of the, you know, we can like think many combinations of our basis yeah. vectors and generate the lattice. Yeah. 
but in my mind, there's two different concepts. There's the concept of the lattice, yeah, which is inherent, and then there's the basis, which is completely degenerate. There's an infinite number yeah. of bases, and they, you know, you can it's the new algebra. Yeah. So there's a lattice which is real, and then there's the new algebra. Yes. And I think in two D must be the same, right? That, that you've got the your point set. But what's happening here is that you said, oh, I've got this. And you want to, and you want something that's continuous, like you're going to map it to an invariant. Yeah. Um, and then you want to vary your variable. Yeah. And when you compute the invariant, invariant have no discontinuities. Yes. And what happens is that when you do that, you you pick a certain definition for your basis. Yeah. And then when that basis does something funky, yeah, you get these discontinuities. Yeah. Right. But the approach I took it with this. PDD is you like throw away the whole basis thing and you just deal with the points. Yeah. And then everything is just continuous. Right. So maybe you've taken two different approaches. Right? I think that's yeah, so it, it is. is yeah, so it, yeah. Yeah. It it is two different approaches. Well, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm intrigued then. So what what's the uh, <clears throat> so there is there is no uh, obvious connection, you're absolutely right, between a lattice and variance and PDD invariant for more general periodic structures. Yeah. Uh, however, even our uh, theorem about generic completeness for PDD needs a lattice. So that's why... Uh, right, right. But, but we're still on firm ground that we've agreed that the lattice is the same and the basis of the lattice is... is Matt, I, I think... Uh, could, could we go to the slide about in, invariants and completeness? I think uh, yeah. uh, this needs a bit more. Uh, ah, okay, yeah. maybe... Yeah. Is, yeah. Is this picture? Is, is this so? This problem. I mean, I, let, let me take a step back. So I don't want sure. to seem like I'm sounding vague. Here. I'm just trying no, to of really understand. Like, I, I I really like this concept. You know, you motivated continuous geometry. Right? Mm -hmm. You've got this tiny, infinite, small chain, and mm -hmm. suddenly these discontinuous things are happening. And that's yeah. And we want to get away from that. And Obviously, when you have when you have your basis and as this thing, mm. you have these discontinuities, and this is a this is a straightjacket of crystallography. Which I know, so yeah. <laughs> feel like we should just just take off the fluids. Yeah. So my 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 view is just take off the straightjacket, like you know, throw away crystallography and try to start again, which yeah. is a little bit what what the kid is doing, but you're trying to actually. Do it within this crystallographic framework, and it seems like maybe you're having success. But, yes, I mean it's a it, it is, I suppose, a stepping stone for that complete doing away with the crystallography. And as the said, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll, 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 we'll do it eventually. <laughs> uh, no, uh, continuous no, crystallography. Continuous crystal. Yeah, so so, so continuous <laughs> crystallography is. Uh, but but also, as, as Vitaly has said, we still require some notion. Of the lattice, there is some kind of underlying notion of lattice, and if you can tie that underlying notion of lattice back to its own continuous characterization, yeah, okay. then we can kind of that's a foundation. So one way, one thing you could possibly do is 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 simply, um, you know, kind of express the points in terms of the invariant and make sure you're you're expressing them to the invariant, right, right. Uh, and then you know you've got continuity all the way down. Right, right. Um, as it were, in your in your selections, and of course there are some. This is also an intermediate heuristic tool. Um, as well for the, between things like this and um, kind of kind of it's a very simple so for example if you're doing CSP if you're in crystal structure prediction and you've got a big load of stuff then one kind of nice cutoff point is if I've got a nice continuous proper space of all lattices I can kind of just say well only look where lattices tend to fall in nature or okay. or if I care actually if I really care about finding something that's aggressively asymmetric and you'll see this in a, a bit later I can actually look there I can look in the I can check in the continuous space how um how asymmetric to, to be very uh very informal about it um a particular structure might be mm -hmm. um and that's kind of uh, that's kind of a thing that you might want to you might want to know or care about because that would be some perhaps useful amplified by this so so it's a tool uh yeah it's a different tool to the pdd yeah. so, but, um so the idea is to go from a discontinuous basis to a continuous invariant. Yeah. And probably this happened here a bit fast. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you show. Um... Yeah, this, this, this is where all the trickery happens. Yeah, but... uh, I, I, I should learn to unpack this slide a bit more. But uh, there's a 
um, yeah, so, so this, is, this is where it all happens. So going from, so using this notion of the, of the super base. So, so Conway is not going to mention him, like, oh, it's a continuous invariant. Is there a proof? There is not. Not, not, not in their paper, really. Uh, so that's been, uh, a lot of the work has, has, has been um, in terms of that. And also then determining from that, how do you get to a map? How do you get to a space? What kind of spaces can you get to? Um, and yeah, you can get to a kind of space that looks like this. But obviously, even then, if you want to visualize this stuff, it's a bit tricky. Um, so we uh, we play around. So essentially, kind of a useful way of this is, well, we might not care up to scaling. And what not caring up to scaling means, well, I, again, because a lot of the use using the, the determinant the volume of a lattice as, as a kind of a size marker. But that's geometrically awkward in terms of the kind of li linear algebra here. What we'd like to do is just drop a hyperplane through this thing. Uh, which we do by um, by defining a size as just the sum of the root invariants, mm -hmm. um, and that's what we do. And that lets you then um, this this kind of uh, what we call the projected invariant or the orientation aware projected invariant, because you can just add a sign to it. Um, uh, then uniquely specifies up to similarity, so it's on true scale. Um, and we kind of add this um, this factor three here for no reason other than you get a nice. Well, I say for no reason, for a useful mathematical reason, to start with, that you get a nice, um, easy to think about right angle isosceles triangle uh, uh, with, with this, but also that you can do some clever gluing tricks. So if I do care about rigid motion, so if I care about not being able to lift my thing over and, and, and flip it over in the plane, um, again, I can do a gluing trick. And in this, in this case, the, the, the gluing trick is to, is to map lattices with, with negative sign. Uh, so that's the positive sign that just maps to the sort of xy coordinate that we get from this this map here, um, and that is the negative sign and map to um, uh, a sort of inverse mapping uh, one minus y one minus x, and that that has a nice uh, um, sort of thing in that in that this diagonal there, then these are all identical lattices along here, so this glues up properly, and any pair of lattices that are just points reflected. In this axis are mirror relations of each other. Um, the, the, you know, the, this is an easy visualized thing. I mean, the, the aim here that, that we're working on is to do this in three dimensions, but, uh, but the principles are similar. And then you can start talking about continuous distances, because this is the bit you have to be careful about: is that you never know what you're going to get in terms of um, uh, in in terms of lattice sign. So we can start talking about metrics and in the quotient triangle so it would be nice if we could just put two points in there and measure the distance between them because that's just a subset of r2 uh, but we can't because we don't know what we're ultimately thinking about is how the notion of chirality uh or the notion of chiral distance is the idea of how far do i have to deform a lattice to get it to somewhere where it's symmetrical um, does this space, or not space? So this is yeah, this is just a vector space. This is just a, this is just ordinary R three. But we have to kind of play with the metric a bit because actually, I don't know which basis vectors I'm going to have to deform, or I could pick a basis vector and deform it into something um, something symmetric, or I could deform it into my target from my source lattice into my target lattice, as it were. Uh, but I don't know which one I'm going to pick. And whether it's easier to kind of pull it through the configuration of a square lattice or through the configuration of a uh, of a centered rectangular lattice. So I kind of, in a sense, need to measure across reflections in all these lattices and then take a minimum. Uh, in, in the oriented case. In the oriented case, yeah. In the oriented case. In the unoriented case, I can just be I can I can just be very straightforward because every um, because we just map to uh, we just make take distance between only two points in the triangle. Uh, but if I care about mirror reflections, then what I have to do is measure a, a minimum distance across all reflections in the borders, which is slightly uh, slightly awkward. Um, and, and much more complicated in the three-dimensional case. Oh, God, yes. Um, so, but yes, in the three-dimensional case, there's all sorts of foldings and things that we're, we're currently looking at and, and quotient spaces and things. But this uh, th this kind of illustrates the, the, the simple point. Um, but this gives you a nice... If you sort of, if all you care about is how asymmetric my molecules are, or my how asymmetric my my, my lattice is, um, then I can just measure distances to the boundary of the space because the boundary of the space is where, in this sense, all my all my symmetrical uh, lattices live. So that's all I do, and I can I can 
indeed, I can, rather than having just one measure of asymmetry, then I can measure specific group asymmetries. I can say how non-square is my lattice, how non-hexagonal is my lattice, by measuring the distance to the point. In this case, because we drop the slice through this, the, the hexagon lives actually at a point. It lives at, the hexagon and the square now live at vertices, which is just the intersections of the hyperplanes with these one-dimensional subspaces. Um, and these, these planes, these hyperplanes uh, with primitive and centered rectangular lattices then become just boundaries of the triangle. And I can measure, and I can do the same thing in three dimensions again, because again, I don't, I don't, I'm not having to minimize across. And if I want a general, um, general notion of chirality or asymmetry, I can just take the minimum overall of that if I want to. Um, so, uh, so that's. I'm sorry, I'm not quite clear about the last portion. <laughs> so, if you have a, a distance for a symmetry, yeah, why do you need to take the minimum? Well, I'm saying if I want to have a general, a general notion of if I, so that I can, I might I might not care necessarily how square or how hexagonal my lattice is, but I might just care how far off being symmetric in some way. Mm. How what's the minimum deformation required to get it to. So let's imagine a complicated yeah. situation when uh, we are finding a nearest distance to, to a curve. So this nearest distance might appear uh, in different directions. Yeah. So you mean the minimal, not for all the distances, but minimal uh, for this point to the borderline? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Minimum, minimum, minimum borderline, which is sort of the minimal, which is the kind of what we, we might call the D2. Yeah, yeah. Distance in that it's the minimum distance to because it's nice and easy for squares and hexagons or certainly it is in, in, in two dimensions because that's just the distance mm -hmm. point but I have to do a bit of minimization so it's, it's kind of slightly awkward um, but we can make it less awkward with, a, with another map map so hopefully uh, that's uh, clear what's this empty point down here uh, well this is where things stop making a great deal of sense so basically this as we kind of head out this way, lattices become longer and thinner and flatter until they become infinitely long. And this is sort of a limit point, although it's a bit messy. Um, is my is, is, is my understanding of this? Uh, and because of that, because there's a kind of forbidden point, this is where we get to the business of the of, of the of the punctured sphere. So a thing to to remember is that obviously this is kind of one copy. Of the space of, 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 of lattices and kind of implicit in the in these reflections is that there's copies surrounding it. Um, and a way kind of, to kind of compactify this is we just kind of compactify it around uh, that that forbidden point of infinity, as it were. And there's a nice kind of geometric way of doing that. You take the 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 um, the, the in circle of your of your right triangle, and then you kind of uh, you kind of use that as an equator. And you project in various directions, uh, directions from it. Um, hopefully, this, this this kind of schematic gives you a, gives you an idea of how you do that. It's it, it's very simple. You just take the the latin the longitude is just the angle around. We pick a zero. In fact, we pick a zero that's directly opposite the forbidden point. Uh, and then the latitude you can just use as a kind of fraction of ninety degrees. That is the fraction along towards the border. So that's the kind of spherical projection uh, we we use here, um, and that uh, that then looks slightly different. But the handy thing there is you can just glue your positive and negative lattices if you care about reflections. You can just glue them along the equator. So you've got a uh, you've got the whole, rather than having this kind of rather awkward thing where you imagine all these spaces sitting out being reflected across the boundary of the triangle. Everything lives in this in in this in this compactified space. And then you can, you know, you can invent other metrics. So we know lots about them. Well, because because people have had to sail around the globe for a bit, we know lots about metrics on the on the surface of the sphere. Uh, we we know they have a sign distance. We know the kind of tables of that being published for, for navigators since the um, since since the eighteen hundreds. Since since I think of the earliest publication I found was eighteen twenty five. Um, and we can kind of measure that as a uh, as as a spherical distance. So we, can, I mean, I mean, th there's any mapping you like really uh, on this, but this is just kind of a nice, easy to visualize one. Um, and if we care about scaling, so if we want to get scaling back, 
uh, we just use height. So we just we we just um, add, you know, put the point on it. We use this size sigma, which is the sum of the root invariant values as a radius. Obviously, the Haversine distance stops working at that point, or rather, there. I mean, there are ways of measuring two points with different heights on a globe, which is uh, which, you know, that that uh, again is a navigational problem that's and a satellite thing that's been sorted, but it's just like you need distances in R3. But, uh, and again, just to give you an idea of where you are in this map, you've then got, you know, where, what are square and um, hexagonal lattices in this sense? Well, they're lines in the plane. Uh, what are uh, rectangular centered lattices? Well, they're just kind of the plane in general. So uh, primitive rectangular centered lattices. And this is an example um, extracted. We just put in a root invariant. So um, all the code for this exists. I'll give you the link at the end, but we've got a nice kind of 2D lattice manipulation thing, which can visualize lattices. You can put in an invariant and get the lattice out. You put in a lattice and get an invariant. Um, um, all of that exists. Uh, and just to show you sort of what that looks like, because somebody actually asked for this. Somebody said, oh, I'd, I'd understand it a little better if I could see like a little point moving around in the sphere and, how, and what it does to lattices. And that's what this is. Cool. Animation. There's a, there's, a, there's a trick here, which I've just got to show you just to watch it. So this is just taking a, we take the red point is where the hexagonal lattice kind of lives on the surface of the sphere. So we're, we're not caring about scaling at this point. We're scaling down to a sphere of radius one. We'll start at the top of this little circle. This is incidentally a kind of a rough uh, view of the point that the path it takes in the in the quotient square, what we're calling quotient square, the sort of square map is slightly, slightly more complicated, but it's still kind of rough schematic of it. Um, and as I start moving my point around the circle, you can see a kind of a gradual deformation. These are all the numbers. If you want to follow them, our root invariant, you can see is kind of changing continuously. Our projected invariant is changing continuously. Um, and as we change sign, so the thing to watch here, so at this point, I have reached the equator. And we have, uh, what you can see here is this is indeed a uh, rectangularly uh, centrally symmetric lattice, but uh, it's kind of hard to see because the lattice, the lattice basis parameters are unequal here, but in fact our, our V naught, our, our superbase has got two equal, our Q superbase has got two equal lattices, two vectors of equal length. And this then looks from a lattice basis uh, perspective like a very discontinuous change. But in fact, all you've done is, um, is actually swapped the longest and shortest vectors. Um, um, what I, I'm hoping this kind of little axis of reflection here shows you is that all I've done, this really is just the application of an isometry here, uh, just, a, just a rotation. Uh, but it's the same lattice and it's continuing to slowly, to slowly deform. And it kind of takes this sort of slightly odd kind of curved pattern along the, uh, along the, um, in the square, so, uh, but eventually uh, it reaches the boundary again and we, we kind of start again. So, Matt, could you highlight uh, the point, uh, the time moment where uh, the basis vectors swap the yeah. lengths, so yes. showing the discontinuity. Yes, so this, this kind of illustrates, so here we are um, just approaching, so we're now nearly at the equator, and here we are at the equator, as it were, of this sphere where we where all the um, centrosymmetric lattices live. Well, yeah, all the all the non-oblique lattices live, um, and that's this this diagonal in terms of the, the quotient square. Um, and you can see here that we have actually um, the the visualizer here picks a a vector. Picks a, a lattice basis with a particular length and angle, um, which are non equal, but we have this kind of secret, secret acute super base angle, uh, acute super base vector that is in fact equal, so kind of length 0.5. And then as I go over the equator, there is what appears to be a discontinuous change in the lattice, but it isn't in fact. It's, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a combination of a, of a continuous change and an isometry in terms of the visualizer, but that's just because we've got an arbitrary visualization. Again. The actual parameters themselves, and if you look at the, at the numbers, there is a continuous change, but there's also a swap of the A and B vector parameters. 
So I go, the, the basis and uh, where basis changes discontinuously, but the root invariant changes continuously. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is, that, that's an example, of course. Yes, not a proof, but yeah, it shows. Yeah, but there is a proof. Yeah. So I don't know where we're at here. Uh, we're getting up the vibe, but that's so. This is the um, so let's let's kind of put this in somewhere. I've got a okay, oh, that was, it's left. um, down. So let's kind of look at some data here. Um, and one kind of very slightly artificial thing to do is to take the CSD and just arbitrarily, well, pick three two dimensional lattices and three dimensional lattices there. So we've got length and angle parameters A, B, C, alpha, B, gamma. We take the triples A, B, gamma, B, C, alpha, C, A, beta, and just see what we've got. The reason we wanted to do that mainly is to get a huge number of things. And we've got, well, now we've got 2.7 million uh, lattices. Um, and this is the map of all. So this is the square map. You've seen the triangle. This is uh, this is us caring about um, orientation, us caring about sign. So we're now mapping negative lattices to the to the to the, the upper right half of the square, um, and you can see a few features here. I think I, this is sort of quite exciting because it really is a, a kind of a view of the universe of, of, of lattice geometry. It's kind of nice. It's quite as continuous. It's not as continuous as you think because nature really does prefer symmetry. So the reason like, we take this as a, as a log of the number of lattices, as a log to the base 10, is because it's hugely biased towards edges. Um, nature wants to be symmetric. But it also, you know, the, the non-oblique lattices actually fill the space slightly better than you'd imagine. Um, down here, obviously, this stops making, obviously, this is, as we say, the limit point. But down when we get down to here, we're really talking about lattices that are squished thinner than you can fit an atom in. So there's, there's so 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 you're not going to get anything down here, but you know we, we were quite surprised I think to see that that there was kind of almost so little structure there. There's a preference towards hexagonal lattices, so things get denser, so you get more uh, more symmetry. But it turns out there's a reason for that. Uh, I'm not going to go into that because it's rather more theoretical. Uh, but we've looked at that, and there's a reason for that, which is that it's actually reproducing a distribution of what you might call random lattices. So 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 so, um, so if you Selected 2D lattices at random, uh, they'd look a bit like this um, for, for rather technical reasons. There's a little dot here, that's oxalic acid, uh, of which there are hundreds of um, are hundreds of structures because it's a nice test molecule. So when you say lattices, you mean structures here, right? So it means structures, yeah. So, so, so I mean, yeah. 3D lattices. 3D lattices. 2D sizes. Right. But your lattice is better one crystal structure. Yeah. Um, all done in about half an hour. Uh, one when we got it um, on on this, so so this is very quick. So it's kind of a useful heuristic to kind of quicker than PDD. Uh, so the, uh, plane cut, so yeah, different orientation. Yeah, to show again. Yes. So, so we take yeah, we can do a plane cut with different with, with three different orientations. Um, it's a bit artificial. We just wanted to do something big to see how fast it could go. And yes, one reason, one way you can see the artificiality is in this bias towards positive lattices. That's not some weird effect of nature that we need to go on running through is just the fact that lattice lengths, lattice um, vector lengths are ordered in the CSD and that, or, or tend to be ordered more often than not. And so that, that's, that bias is, is entirely artificial. Um, you can start, so if you take the actual chiral measure, so let's take these chiral distances, um, and again, you can see what we've done here is if you put the uh, the non-oblique lattices in, then you wouldn't see anything. You just see just a massive zero. So, so this is just for those lattices that are in the interior of the square. And you can see here that there is this, um, the artificial preference positive. So we're multiplying the sign by the chiral distances. Um, and you can see this kind of um, preference towards uh, towards symmetry. So, so this is it's distributed. Like strongly around symmetry. If I take kind of squareness, so this is measuring the distance from the uh, from the point representing square lattices. Uh, you can see that there is uh, that there are kind of peaks, which will kind of roughly explain. It. This is about kind of root two over two, um, and interestingly, uh, there isn't a lot that's very close to square. If you take out the actually square lattices, the lattices that are actually designated as as, as being exactly ninety degrees, uh, then there isn't a lot close to that. And it turns out there's kind of a combination of, 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 of practical and, and mathematical reasons for that. Whereas if you go close to hexagonal, so this is hexagonality, you've got peaks of about 0.5, and uh, and you do get lattices that are kind of very close to hexagonal. 
as it were. Why might this be? Uh, one reason is mathematical, actually, just because just of the way we set it up. If you perturb a square lattice slightly away from 90 degrees, then the chiral distance value actually rises quite rapidly, and then it rises more slowly. So, so you will see that. But also we think one thing that might be happening is that there is sort of, um, if something's very close to 90 degrees or something is solved very close to 90 degrees, then there may be more of a decision to round it to 90 degrees as it's well. square. Uh, so whereas if something's close to hexagonal, that might be actually harder to spot uh, necessarily in a two. So, so, that, so that there's kind of less tendency to, to round off maybe. But also, so why do the P, so you, you'll see a bit more of that. So why do the peaks exist? Well, that you can see by, if you look at the triangle, if you take that, so, so these really are just, these densities here really are just values at, at circles of constant radius from the, at the point representing the hex to the point representing the square. Uh, and there's a peak at kind of one over root two, uh, mainly because you've kind of got the longest intersection of a circle. Uh, with the triangle, and also it's passing through a very, uh, it's passing through a kind of dense area at the top. If you make it any smaller, then you kind of, you're intersecting fewer lattices. If you make it any larger, then you're kind of outside the triangle and the density drops off fairly, fairly rapidly. Also, as it turns out, oxalic acid plays a role in sharpening the peaks in that that particular radius kind of hits it. Uh, if you take um, Y half, well, again, um, you know, there's just schematically just the further away you get from hexagonality, uh, the less dense things become. But also, uh, the again, you have this effect where your circle is intersecting more of the more of the triangle. And that, without going into the, you know, we haven't done any computations on this, but that's going to naturally lead to some kind of maximum uh, in terms of density that you get about half. Uh, you get about kind of sort of a radius one half. So, um, so that's kind of explaining that kind of slightly artificial structure. Um, and you can, uh, you know, just, uh, just going, I'll, actually I'll skip over this because these aren't very big differences. And what I mainly want to do is talk about a real, um, uh, a real uh, kind of world application, which is 2D material. This is a very growing field. You know, it's been a while since graphene and since then uh, people have been making uh, thin layer materials out of uh, all sorts of things and uh, all sorts of materials. Uh, so this has been growing and growing. There's thousands of them now in, in various public databases, and not all of them are elemental, not all of them are kind of just graphene or boron. There's a lot, there's a lot more to it now. Uh, uh, so why would chiral distance matter in this case? Well, it turns out uh, uh, that people actually quite, so if you can manage to get very asymmetric uh, sort of monolayer unit cells in some way, uh, then you can get some some useful uh, properties. Uh, you get to, you you get useful band gap properties. I mean, I am not a physical chemist, so this is not my uh, my nece necessarily my area. But my understanding is you can get these useful, and, and you can get these anisotropic properties that people want. I mean, you can see why it might be quite useful to have something that behaves differently depending on how you orient, say, a current going across it. Compared, you know, you can. You can see all sorts of uh, sorts of reasons for that. Now, there's lots of ways to get asymmetry. Some of them kind of aren't to do with what I'm doing in the sense that they're about these things not really being two dimensional um, and, and and having some depth to them, and the, the, the kind of the asymmetry lives in that in that depth. But also, you can try and get. There are materials like that now, uh, particularly sort of MX2 types, which have um, genuine lattice um, lattice two D lattice asymmetry geometrically. So we might want to find those. Um, so I've been using kind of big publicly available uh, uh, 2D materials databases. 2D Mappedia is quite an interesting one because it's kind of highly theoretical in nature. You take a load of kind of bulk 3D crystals. Uh, you do a kind of topological procedure. Well, initially you start by doing a sort of topological procedure uh, where you kind of grow unit cells and see how connect how fast connected features grow. And in theory, if you've got a 2D layer, it should grow as n squared. If you've got some 3D connected structure, it should grow as n cubed. And you've just got a dot that's not that. Uh, is the idea. So you, you kind of count how things grow. Uh, and then you do some clever stuff where you substitute, you make near periodic tables, you know, sensible periodic table substitutions. As, as a result, you generate a bunch of, um, you generate about 6,500 or so, or 6,300 um, uh, potential 2D materials, which you can then kind of further simulate. Um, 
what do they look like in the QT? Well, a lot of them live symmetrically. You, they really want, and we'll see like on their own as well. But, you know, these more perhaps even than uh, than crystals, uh, more more perhaps even than kind of ordinary lattices. These huge materials we want to be uh, highly symmetric, like graphene is graphene. But we do kind of among the theoretical materials, we do have things living in the interior of the square, and we have it living on sort of both sides of the, of the square. So there's no kind of preference for the sign. Um, and there are materials that could potentially have have high asymmetry, have high chiral distances. So what we want to do is we want to find plausible ones. Unfortunately, what this database does is it measures a couple of useful things uh, chemically. It measures the decomposition energy. So this wants to be high for things that are stable, is my understanding, because otherwise uh, they fall apart quite easily. And it measures something called the exfoliation energy, which is roughly kind of how much energy you have to put in a two-dimensional layer. Um, of, now, I'm barely breaking on, on this, but this is, my, uh, this is, this is how I've, I've understood it. Um, and so what we can then do is kind of overlay chiral distance values on this and say what's got a high decomposition energy, a low exfoliation energy, and um, and uh, is also strongly asymmetric. So, so this then becomes another bit of data. So we can find um, we can find some data in this plot. This is the plot we did uh, we did out of this database. And I've just picked out three that we found. One is kind of a confirmation, a kind of proof of concept. We found antimony telluride. Antimony telluride is a is experimentally isolated. It's a semiconducting monolayer. Use the materials project. Very useful to pick out uh, kind of publications and things on this. Uh, so that's that. There are lots of publications about that, and it's uh, it, it's it is used as a monolayer. Um, we found this thing, octachlorotricylene, uh, which isn't published as a monolayer anywhere, as far as we know. Although it's published as a precursor. Uh, to other monolayers, so you use it as a as a reagent a lot, uh, to to make um, to make monolayers of a of a slightly different type. Um, so this this again lives in the envelope as as, as far as we understand it of, of, of possibly say the two D layers. And then you know we found we found this thing, uh, which doesn't which exists. Well, it does exist in the materials project, but it turns out it only exists in the materials project because 2D Mappedia put it there. Nobody's done done anything about it. I've just rotated the, the, the picture of the materials project so that you can sort of see why somebody might have found a monolayer there or found a two-dimensional, um, a possible two-dimensional two approach. But the point is that, you know, we maybe we can go and look at this again. I might go and take this to a chemist and they might say, what on earth is this? We can conceivably make this in, in the world. Uh, or it might be something that uh, that is similar to something that they've made, uh, but have not considered as a as a two dimensional material. So the, the, so the notion here is that we can use this, uh, we can use this to explore possibilities of two dimensional materials. But we have to be careful. And the materials cloud two D database, which is another published database that um, that we've looked at, uh, Campy and and Bune, again does a similar thing, but it also simulates the exfoliation of some of the candidate structures. So two D Mappedia finds you the 2D geometries, uh, and it finds you the potential for, for making 2D layers, but it doesn't kind of try to make, as it were, it's, 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 it's my understanding. Um, so, it, but in the case of the materials cloud, they've taken some subset of those layers where they look particularly likely and said, okay, I'm gonna do DFT. I'm gonna peel a layer away, I'm gonna see what it does on its own. Um, so if you take, again, if you take the whole materials cloud database, it's slightly smaller, then everything lives nicely uh, in the, we, again, you can see everything wants to be symmetrical, everything really wants to be symmetrical, uh, but things do live in the interior of this, of, of this space, there, there are sort of asymmetric monolayers, high chiral distance monolayers. But what happens when you take the, what happens when you take it away? They all go and start living in the border spaces. So when you start simulating them uh, on their own, they all go and live in the border spaces. I've just kind of pointed out some known things here of various kinds. Uh, so you do have to be careful. We can pick these things out, but then it's it, it, it's very likely that they might. But some of them don't. So it is possible to make these things. Uh, and these these are very much existing structures. I, I, I'm not aware that they're published as, as, as 2D structures, but they they will. Um, you know, it's not impossible, but it does look like things, these, these, these things really, really want to, to live on the borders of this space. But that's a kind of a, a thing that, that is now kind of very visible as an effect uh, because of this mapping. 
so yeah, we've got a map from the set of all 2D lattices to any space topologically equivalent to the function sphere. So you can pick a sphere, you can pick a, uh, uh, yeah, you can very predict the plane, you can do a, a number of things. Um, and, uh, you know, you, and you can then create, investigate that as a metric space. And we can generalize that to, to having an actual proper continuous measure of chiral distance for, for two dimensional lattices. Um, and we can use that to isolate kind of theoretically stable, strongly asymmetric lattice structures. Um, and uh, we, you know, that might help us find something with, uh, with useful chemical properties. Code's all there. Lots of pictures, lots of visualizations for, for you to use. Please feel free to have a go at the GitHub. Um, I'll probably improve the documentation as we go at some point if, uh, if it all works. So that's uh, thank you, thank you, Matt. Okay, so.